Okay, so A2 MCQs, uh, May, June 2016, variant 2. What action by a firm is most likely to raise its dynamic efficiency? Um, and the difference between dynamic efficiency and static efficiency, Sherryar, if you could enlighten us. Achha, so, very basic, in a very basic terms, like static is when you have a particular point of efficiency, and dynamic is when like you are uh, calculating it, you are seeing it over a longer or larger period of time. So, like over time, to change the of time, that is usually referred to as dynamic. All right. Um, so, let's... It is possible that we might not even need to uh, take into account the dynamic factor here, but let's look at the options. Uh, dis A, distributing all its current profit to its existing shareholders, well, that won't increase your efficiency. Uh, in fact, when you retain your profits and put them back inside the business and trainings and so on, that increases efficiency. Um, maximizing the labor productivity of its current workers, well, that could be your answer because, well, labor productivity increasing that would increase efficiency and even though it's just current workers um, that might increase their efficiency for as long as they're employed but let's look at the other options minimizing the average cost of producing its current output um, so again that is uh, an example of efficiency but i would say that b is still better than c because if you have if your workers efficient productivity has gone up then whatever whatever levels of output they produce, not just today, but like as long as they're employed, their efficiency, the efficiency of the firm will go up. This is just for one particular, uh, for the current output. So maybe not that much. Um, retaining its current profit for product research and development. And Sharyar, would you, would you say we can go with D as our final answer? I think it's D, like, okay, they've emphasized a lot on dynamic partner. So like research and development is a very particular thing. So you will go with which one? D. Yes, uh, I will also go with D. And the idea here is because um, the reason we crossed out C was because it's just for a particular output. And by that same logic, now that we have D, we can cross out D because you maximize labor productivity of your current workers. Those are just your current workers. You will have new workers. And so in the long run, you might not be very efficient over a longer period of time. However, if you put stuff into research and development and hence technological advancement, well, that would create some efficiency that lasts a while. That is dynamic. Um, the current distribution of goods between two individuals in a two-person economy with given technology and resources is point X. According to the Pareto criterion, which point would definitely indicate increased allocative efficiency? So understand by the Pareto criterion, um, no one... Uh, can be made uh, worse off. So it doesn't matter how, you know, how much better Tariq is getting, let's say, uh, or how much better Samir is getting, but the idea is uh, either one of the two cannot, cannot be made worse off. So if you look at this, these are the goods they have. This can't decrease. It can't go like this. So that can't happen. So now let's look at which case would definitely increase um, allocative uh, efficiency and I guess that would be B because if you look at B, Samir's good increase and Tariq's good remain the same. You can cross out A because in that case Samir's goods would decrease so that's not Pareto, uh, that doesn't fulfill the Pareto criterion. In D, Tariq's good would decrease so that you can cross that out. Um, in C, Samir's good would increase by a lot but since Tariq's goods are decreasing, Tariq's being made worse off, you can cross that out leaving your answer as D because Tarek's is the same and Samir gets better off. The concept of allocative efficiency assumes that each individual in society is the best judge of their own economic welfare, which assumption of which example of government intervention is based on an argument which rejects this assumption. So what are we rejecting? That each individual in society is the best judge of their economic welfare. So we reject, th th there needs to be an example that rejects this uh, 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 assumption. And okay, so the, you can cross out, so the so pollution controls, subsidies for merit goods, provision of public goods, you can pretty, pretty much cross out provision of public goods because uh, people still 
want public goods, uh, even they might not be willing to pay for it, but still, they still recognize the importance of public goods. Um, people still dislike monopolies, uh, so it's not. So you're you're kind of looking for a case where the person himself is harming himself or is harming their own economic welfare. Um, so so it's not the individual's fault per se in C and D. Uh, uh, with with pollution, well, individuals do co contribute to pollution. But perhaps we can conclude with D because here clearly uh, the individual himself is um, making a bad decision. He, I mean, he's not the best judge. So there's a decision making involved here because he is, he or she is under uh, demanding or under consuming merit goods, but actually he should be consuming a lot more. Um, is that, are we fine with this? Uh, but like in it's me, uh, it's like pollution wala argument okay makes sense ki chalo they might in the, what i don't get is ki like what, what are they exactly looking for in this question okay it could be c as well it could be a as well Okay, so so the idea here is that you have to look look in for an argument that rejects the assumption, and the assumption is that each individual in society is the best judge of their own economic welfare, that they know what's best for them. To put it simply, that they know what's best for them. case, pollution people don't realize they even if they realize they're not the best judge, and they do tend to go over I understand, I, I can see to the fact that people themselves do contribute to pollution because they don't necessarily realize that they're harming themselves and hence they're not the best judge. But there are still a lot of external factors to pollution, factories, so on, big corporations, stuff of that sort. A lot of which, a lot of the time, well, if the person himself realizes that pollution is not good for me and he, he or she still might suffer from, from pollution. But with merit goods, it's clearly, it's like, it's like, I think it's more of an absolute answer here because, well, you could just buy more merit goods. You could just demand more merit goods, but you don't because you don't know the best, what's best for you. You think you do, but you don't. So we reject this assumption that you know what's the best for you. Uh, you are demanding this level of merit goods isn't good enough. You need more and we're going to subsidize it to ensure you're going to consume more. Um, Hopefully that'll be right. We we uh, as we do in all of our uh, questions, we check our answers after every ten questions, and if we get any wrong, we just we just visit them then and explain the correct answer. Anyhow, four in the indifference curve diagram, point M is the initial uh, equilibrium, and M N is the substitution effect of a fall in the price of good X. Okay, and you can clearly see that as units of good X have gone up. And this is basically your substitution effect. If good X is a given good, which point will be the consumer's new equilibrium point after the fall in the price of good X? So now think of this. If the price of good X goes down, your real income uh, should go up because your purchasing power goes up. Now think of it like this. Uh, a given good is basically like an extreme form of an inferior good. So with all inferior goods, what happens is when your income goes up, uh, the amount of demand that you have for the particular good uh, goes down. Uh, there was an inverse relationship. So your income effect in this case uh, is negative, right? Your substitution effect was positive, uh, but your income effect is negative. And in a given good, uh, it overrides the substitution effect. So basically you should have something like you, you went like this for the substitution effect but now you should override it. So you should go back to M and more, which goes to A. Uh, and another way to look at this is, uh, is simple. Uh, another thing that you should look at that you should know for the Giffen good is that it has an upward sloping demand curve. So if let's say price falls, your quantity should also fall. So you, I can explain this through that way as well. Uh, so price fell, the quantity you were consuming of X was this much. So your quantity should clearly fall. And the only option that gives you a quantity fall is A. Um, so that is another way you can look at it. Five, to maximize the satisfaction he derives from a given level of expenditure on two goods, X and Y, a consumer should allocate his expenditure between the two goods such that uh, so the idea here is the marginal utility of X upon price of X should be equals to the marginal utility of Y upon price of Y. Uh, and I believe uh, 
yeah so this is this is fine if you just rearrange it like that um you should be fine so you can just tick off d not too much to worry there which statement about the kink demand curve model of oligopoly is incorrect the kink in the demand curve of each firm is based on expectations about the other firm's responses to changes in its price well that's fine uh, yeah that's that's fine because well the reason why there, it's king the reason why there is price rigidity is because if you go alone uh, you expect the rival to react in such a way that you could don't really manage to increase your market share and there's an there are proper explanations for that anyhow the marginal revenue curve of the firm has a vertical segment at the market price um so if you look at the diagram here the price you have quantity kind of goes like this elastic and then suddenly inelastic so that is your demand curve and if you draw uh, which is your basically your ar curve as well this is your ar curve as well um if you draw your your mr curve it kind of comes like this um and then there's a somewhat of a discontinuous region one could say so you could you could call this almost like a vertical region um but is that necessarily uh, at, at the market price because the market price is this we know that for sure that's the idea of price rigidity uh, maybe if i draw this a little accurately well or i just could just accidentally rub all of it but if you draw this a little accurately there's some figure something like this and then vertical segment and then this so yeah maybe i guess you could say that it has a vertical segment at the market price what do you think ah, you so say, i thought it's very clear market vertical segment hota hai mc is ke niche agar rise kar bhi lega to wo price nahi badega you can't really change price all right okay so yeah we can cross off b and perhaps that's another reason why a reason contributing to market rigidity because uh, even if mc changes a bit oh, in in this particular region uh, the same price would prevail anyhow the model explains how the equilibrium market price is determined uh, no the, the I, i don't think so 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 the idea here is it explains why it sticks to this market price but it does not explain how where this market price comes about from and in fact that's a pretty big criticism of the king demand curve model it's a pretty popular criticism uh, let's look at d anyways the model suggests price stickiness within a certain range of marginal costs well it does because as we saw here if marginal costs go pass through this discontinuous region uh, the price and output combination wouldn't change there would be no effect so obviously price is sticky there um, so we can go with c a monopolist changes its objective from profit maximization to sales revenue maximization um okay so let's 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 draw something here so for profit maximization you go mc is equals to mr that is mc this is mr so you have this um they want you to look at profit so let me try to calculate profit here before i move on uh so this is your now now you for to calculate profit you have to look at the fact that this is your ar and where is your aac your average cost that is here so this is your per unit profit and this would be your overall profit so you just take the per unit profit and you multiply it into overall profit so that would give you uh p1 h um i believe this was a g what was this i i i've just drawn too much over it yeah it was a g and and f so let's quickly look yeah so you can just cross out a, a, a and b just on just on those grounds uh and now we have to look uh okay, i can just rub this because we have what what we need for our original profit now let's look at the new thing so sales revenue maximization uh is basically when pr is maximized which happens MR. when when yes exactly when mr is zero so that is here so you go like this now if you look at it here this is where your ac dips so this kl would be your per unit um profit and this would be your overall profit giving you p2 k l f in whatever order p2 k l f p2 k l f giving you c a firm estimates that 
all else remaining unchanged, an increase in output will result in a fall in its revenue. Um, an increase in output. Okay, so think of it this way: an increase in output. If quantity increases, uh, price should decrease. You know, if it's an uh, uh, that usually happens, but unless it's a given good, uh, which is just an extreme case. So price should decrease. So now look at it like this: a decrease in price results results in a fall in its revenue, and that happens when this is inelastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, sorry. So PED is inelastic. Uh, so the demand for the product is price inelastic. And let me just quickly explain this. You should already know this, but the idea here is if it's inelastic, um, why does a decrease in price reduce total revenue? Uh, total revenue is price into quantity. Remember, uh, if, if it's inelastic, you could decrease price by uh, however much you wanted. However, your quantity demanded would increase, but by a very small amount. So what's happened is price decreased by a large amount. Quantity demand has went up by a little amount. So overall total revenue has decreased. Um, so that is the reason why a decrease in price in the, uh, if a decrease in price is resulting in a fall in its revenue, that would mean that the product is definitely price uh, inelastic. The demand for it, the PED is uh, you know, less than one. Anyhow, the diagram shows cost and revenue curves of a firm. What, which diagram does the firm uh, represent? Well, it's definitely not a per firm in perfect competition. Um, so this is either a monopoly or a firm in monopolistic competition, one could say. Well, now if you look at this, so let's okay. So let's let's first look at which what type of profits they're making. So the MC is equals to MR is where you produce. You find the price from your demand curve, uh, and because your 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 uh, demand curve, which is average uh, revenue and uh, ATC is basically average cost, average total cost, then that, that's the same. It should be normal profits. So it's not short term losses. It's not abnormal profits. It is just normal profits. It would be a little difficult to tell uh, whether this is monopolistic or a monopoly because they just have the same diagram. The, this, the, the, the demand curve for a monopolist for a firm in monopolistic competition is just a little more elastic. Uh, so for a monopoly, this would, the demand curve might be something like this and the MR curve might be something like this. Um, so the main reason why we, we were able to figure out it is A is because that's the only option with normal profits. Um, anyhow, which is a risk bearing economy of scale? Um, so greater, so, so what do you think they mean by a risk bearing economy of scale? So this type may basically when you have a greater product line, you have basically a larger number of things in production, which means you can diversify your uh, costs. For that. So if there is a loss, you can uh, uh, calculate it over a greater output. This case will minimize it. Oh, so this is, this is basically something that is risk reducing. Uh, because like basically bearing makes those uh, contacts about the legal other push in Masla Hota be here. So you can spread the cost around. Na? Yeah. Now, if you want to reduce your risks, it's a, it's a pretty cliched uh, answer to that, that you just have to diversify, sell different product in different markets so that even if you have uh, losses in one market, you can um, still bear those uh, losses and still uh, overcome them by profits in from other markets. So we can just go ahead and uh, pick B, greater diversification of the product range. Uh, I think we're good for that. So shall we check our answers? Uh, okay, so we're all good for now. Uh, all 10 of our MCQs were marked correctly. And we'll continue this paper in the next video.